We right to go? Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you for coming along here this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Rosemary Lang. I'm the current clerk of the Senate. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respects to all Australia's Indigenous elders, past and present. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to the Evans family who have been able to join us on this occasion and to all of those who have made great efforts to come some distances to participate in this first Harry Evans lecture. Harry Evans, as many of you will be aware, spent 21 years as Clerk of the Senate, the longest of any clerk. His work for the Senate spanned 40 years of dedicated parliamentary service. His death a year ago was a great shock to all of us who knew and worked with him and who admired him very much so. Now, available at the lecture, you probably already have it in your hands, is a, a collection of reflections about Harry's career from a group of people who observed Harry's work on a daily basis um, and some from a greater distance. But we've compiled this memorial booklet for the purpose of this lecture. And I'd like to thank very much all of those contributors who have uh, written pieces for the booklet. Uh, it also contains lots of lovely photographs as well. And, uh, and I'd like to thank them all for sharing their reminiscences, their wit and their insight into a true giant of the Senate. So thank you very much to former senators, Margaret Reid, Gareth Evans, Michael Macklin, uh, Noel Crichton-Brown, Michael Behan, former president, Andrew Murray, John Faulkner, and, uh, oh, me. But uh, <laughs> don't read it now, uh, but take it home and, and cherish that. I'd also like to convey apologies from several former senators who've contacted me over the past few weeks, uh, including former President Margaret Reid, who was unable to be here tonight, Shirley Walters, who rang me about 10 days ago and informed me that in two days' time she would be 90 years of age. Uh, and she still sounds exactly the same. <laughs> Also from former Senators Don Jessup, Dee Margetts, Kay Denman and Rosemary Crowley. I'd particularly like to acknowledge former President Doug McClelland, who was also unable to join us tonight, but who assures us that he will be here in spirit. And I've promised to send him a DVD. And, uh, and I'd also like to thank him very much for allowing me to pester him over the past few weeks to nut out some of the finer details of the history of the Parliamentary Privileges Bill 1986. But I'd now like to ask the current President of the Senate, Senator the Honourable Stephen Parry, to say a few words about the Harry Evans Lecture and to introduce our lecturer tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rosemary. And um, one other thank you needed to be added to that list, and that is to the Clerk of the Senate uh, for her, her coordination and initiative in establishing uh, this lecture and also in coordinating uh, the publication. So well done, Rosemary. It's been much appreciated. Now, I have some parliamentary colleagues here with me, uh, and, but also uh, some past parliamentary colleagues, and I particularly want to acknowledge the uh, former President of the Senate, uh, Michael Bean, uh, because it was nice that uh, he could be here, and I always feel as though I'm the the latecomer when I see all these new, uh, when I see all these past uh, senators and presidents. And also, uh, could I acknowledge the deputy president of the Senate here as well, uh, Senator Marshall? So thanks for joining us too, Gavin, and all my colleagues. It is certainly my pleasure this evening to introduce this inaugural uh, Harry Evans lecture. The annual uh, Harry Evans lecture will take at. at as its focus, matters championed by Harry during his tenure as clerk, and many of you would remember a lot of the issues he did champion, including the importance of the Senate as an institution. There's one thing about Senators, we particularly value the independence of the Senate and the value it is as an institution within our great democracy. As a fearless promoter of the Senate's role to hold the executive to account, there would be few more qualified to present the inaugural lecture than Dr. Michael Macklin. Dr Macklin was a, an Australian Democrat Senator for Queensland from 1981 to 1990. His name certainly lives on in the standing orders. 
as the instigator of the so-called Macklin motion. This measure imposed deadlines on the receipt of bills from the House of Representatives to avoid a rush of legislation at the end of each sitting period. And I was only reminded as recently as today that the House of Representatives believes that once they pass a bill down there, it's just a matter of minutes before we finish it off up here. Uh, Harry certainly resisted that as we do as senators. The uh, a modified version of this procedure, the Macklin motion, uh, still exists today to ensure that the Senate certainly has the adequate time to consider legislation. And for those that aren't familiar, it's what we call the cut-off provision where bills must be introduced so there are uh, still plenty of sitting weeks left at the end of each session to debate the bills. Dr Macklin has had a hand in many other Senate reforms, including the establishment of the 30-day rule for questions on notice, aimed at making ministers provide answers to questions to the Senate in a more timely fashion. And there'll be many ministers that regret that uh, ever being implemented. He was also an advocate of the systematic uh, referral of bills to committees for examination and report and of the sensible setting, uh, Senate, Senate sitting hours. Uh, sometimes that doesn't quite go to plan, but uh, we have a, a far better regime than what used to exist. During his time in the Senate, Dr Macklin introduced 79 private senators' bills, the largest number by any parliamentarian since Federation. The title of the commemorative booklet, Nine Tenths of the Senate Iceberg, is a quote from our speaker tonight and serves as a metaphor for the work that Harry Evans and the Department of the Senate as a whole does below the surface from the public gaze. In his presentation tonight, Dr Macklin expands on Harry Evans' role as a reforming traditionalist, codifying the practices and, def and defending the powers of the Senate while innovating for the needs of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Macklin, Dr. Macklin's presentation tonight, Serving the Senate, the Legacy of Harry Evans. Thank you, Mr. President, for the introduction and for the kind words from the clerk. It is indeed a singular honour to be asked to deliver the inaugural address in honour of Harry Evans' 40 years of parliamentary service. It is fitting that it should occur in this Parliament House that was opened in the same year that Harry became Clerk of the Senate. I'm hopeful, and I'm sure the organisers of this lecture series in the Department of the Senate are also, that this annual address will, over time, provide a comprehensive account of the contributions that Harry Evans made to the workings of the Senate and through it to the operation of the Federation. My approach will be a personal one for two reasons. First, Harry was one of those people who looked you in the eye and worked with you as a person, not as another addition to his work day. And second, I want to record the human interaction that this man of deep conviction and daunting inter intellect had and I know better way to do it than by setting out what I encountered over the decade of the 1980s. On the 1st of July 1981, the Australian Democrats gained the balance of power in the Senate, and I took on the role of whip on my first day in the House. An unenviable task at the best of times, and this was not the best of times, given the hostility of the then government to our very existence. Luckily for me, I had two great mentors, Don Chip and Harry Evans. Don had 20 years of experience in the House of Representatives and the Senate and was a quick thinker in the often moving parliamentary struggles. He was also someone who thought that upsetting the apple cart was a good tactic. On the other hand, Harry's expertise was not so much about the immediate reaction, but about the underpinning procedures practices and structures that needed to be addressed. The two men were almost the embodiment of the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman's System 1 and System 2, where System 1 is fast, in intuitive and uh, in instinctive rather, and emotional, while System 2 is slower, more deliberate and more logical. It was certainly fortuitous for me that in the early 1980s, Harry was given the job of heading up the Procedures Office, an office tasked with not only providing support 
to the opposition and government, but also with a special brief to assist the minor parties in the Senate with procedural advice and legislative support. In my address today, I would like to reflect upon how Harry went about his task by referring to a number of events, which I hope will illustrate not only his capacities, but also his political philosophy. It may seem strange to suggest that a political philosophy was central to Harry's work, when it is normally assumed that the role of the clerk and his or her various assistants is essentially apolitical. However, I contend it is simply not possible for someone fulfilling such an important role in an effective manner not to bring to it a comprehensive and well-developed political and philosophical stance. I will contend that in Harry's case, this stance informed advice he gave and how and when he gave it. A good example of this is to consider the idea that gave unity to Harry's extraordinary lifetime contribution, the advancement of the Senate as part of our federal democratic structure. In other words, he took the considered view that the Senate is not only part of our federal parliament as determined by the constitution, but that the Senate should be viewed as a good thing. He believed that an enhancement of its role provided more benefits, not less. Harry had a clear and cogent view as to what the role of the Senate ought be and how best that might be achieved. Harry's political philosophy also happened to be one with which I concurred. Nevertheless, it's reasonable to reflect that this concept is not universally admired amongst people in this building and that from time to time, even prime ministers have been heard to express their emphatic views to the contrary. In other words, his espousal of such a political philosophy was not without significant political and personal risks. It is this central idea of Senate advancement upon which I wish to focus in this lecture and to do so via discussion of a number of items that, at least for me as a crossbench senator, epitomised Harry's approach to his work. I've chosen items with which I was involved in order to unpack not only the theoretical aspects of his work, but also to illustrate how this theory became concrete by the day-to-day -day personal interactions that Harry had with senators, he sought his advice and counsel. As one would expect, Harry carried out various roles in the Department of the Senate through a wide variety of approaches. A clear and readily accessible example is how he sought to systematise his advice to senators so that it would be part of a coherent whole. His most impressive intellectual contribution in this regard appeared with his rewriting and simplification of Odger's Australian Senate practice and the standing orders of the Australian Senate. Unfortunately, the value of these works to enhancing Senate practice has gone almost unrecognised. In seeking to elucidate Senate practice, Harry was not just about recording what was, but also about commenting on practice and illustrating how that practice provided the legislature with an operational Senate fit for purpose. It is only possible to carry <coughs> out such a task if one has a comprehensive, indeed cyclopedic, understanding of the wide variety of standing orders, how they interact and why, together with an ability to show how such rules enhance the Senate's capacity to carry out its work within the Federal Parliament. His work on these two volumes consolidated the past, amplified the context of that time and prepared the Senate for its future. Of course, as Harry was not reluctant to point out, the Senate is really under government control in terms of the numbers, and so procedures and practices assume a far more important role in the Senate than they do in the House. I rem well remember often hearing in the corridors of this building the adage, if you haven't got the logic, the numbers will do, as an explanation of how government which has the majority in a chamber, will eventually act. 
The Daily Whips meeting in the Senate at that time were ones where a group of people worked together harmoniously in an attempt to achieve the maximum output from the Senate for all parties concerned. In those early years, I very much appreciated the wise counsel and advice provided to me by both the Labor and Liberal Senate Whips, Ted Robertson and Bernie Kilgariff, both extraordinary personalities. The work that we had to carry out was not easy, but our decisions were reached through reasonable discussion and adequate compromise. Of course, this was necessary since it took two of the three whips to agree in the Senate, whereas it only took one, the government whip, in the House. This is one of the reasons that the practices in the Senate have developed differently from those in the House of Representatives, where the government almost always has had a majority. The Senate's historic lack of a single group in control has meant that the crossbench senators in particular have had to spend countless hours reading and digesting both Odgers and standing orders in order to be able to comprehend and be involved in a meaningful way in the often arcane practices of the Senate. Those who remember Senator Harradine will remember how effectively he was, even though he operated alone for almost all of his political career. One could but delight in his calling upon seldom used and in fact often unheard of Senate practices to the consternation of the government of the day and to the gratification of the opposition. Harry was of the view that all senators ought to be able to so contribute and his work on the standing orders and Senate practice was directed to providing as much support as possible in order to bring this about. It is a testimony to Harry's clarity of thought that crossbench senators, whilst coming from a wide range of previous occupations, could still find operational practices of the Senate, as revealed in Harry's writings, both comprehensive and comprehensible. For some in Parliament House, providing such support to the crossbench smacked of subversion of the government of the day, but I think upon more mature consideration, it was clear that those who occupied the so-called balance of power seats needed to be able to be involved as systematically as possible if the legislative program was to move ahead efficiently. Interestingly, the reason for the complete rewrite of Odgers and standing orders was largely due to another of Harry's controversial approaches, and this was his capacity to inspire reform. Again, this may seem strange, but let me illustrate what is probably the federal reform with which Harry was involved. This was the historic patriation of parliamentary privilege by the passage of the Parliamentary Privileges Act of 1987, the consequential adoption by the Senate of the Privilege Resolutions of 1988, and through a cascading effect, the far-reaching amended standing orders adopted in 1989. These through three intertwined items have Harry's fingerprints indelibly all over them. All those around at the time will remember Harry's devastatingly reasoned responses to various judges who sought to assert their court supremacy over the historic freedom of the parliament to conduct its own business. The clarity and persuasiveness of his writing of his written responses ensured comprehensive cross-party support for the historic move to assert the rights and privileges of the parliament. Of course, this move has started much earlier with the appointment of a joint committee on parliamentary privilege in 1982, of which I was a member for the two years and the two parliaments under the two different governments that it took us to deliberate and deliver our report. Unfortunately, like all other previous attempts to utilise the constitutional power and patriate parliamentary privilege, from the House of Commons to the Commonwealth Parliament, our report, once presented, looked as though it would merely gather dust, since the government, like all previous governments of various persuasions, was extremely reluctant to set aside time for such matters 
out of their busy legislative program. While the Constitution clearly pointed to the ability of the Parliament to declare its own powers, privileges and immunities, as well as those of its members and committees, no progress had been made since 1901, despite a number of attempts to do so. Consequently, in 1985, I introduced a private member's bill into the Senate to give force to the recommendations contained in the report of the, Parliament, of the Committee on Parliamentary Privilege. In the House of Representatives, a fellow committee member, eminent QC John Spender, who was then the member for North Sydney, had also introduced a bill, different in style from mine, but with the same essential purpose. Regardless of these attempts, no movement had occurred on either bill over a number of sitting months. And so on the 9th of April, 1986, I took the opportunity while debating a proposal from Mr. President to intervene in a court case concerning Justice Murphy, in which inter alia parliamentary privilege was under attack, to suggest that, and I quote from Hansard, there has been 86 years of government in this country and nothing has happened. In directing my remarks to you, Mr. President, I wonder whether or not it may be time for unprecedented action on your part in sponsoring a bill in this chamber and providing time, as you are able to do, to debate that bill. I would hope that you will give serious consideration to the proposal I put to you because it seems to me that without your taking some action, nothing is ever likely to happen. Of course, I knew when I put that proposal to the Senate President that it was possible for the presiding officer to introduce such a bill since I'd raised the issue with Harry Evans prior to the statement being made by the President in the Chamber and sought his advice, his advice on the wording. As Whip, I knew from our daily Whip meetings that the Senate was to be made that day and I'd taken the opportunity to meet with Harry to see if it was possible for the President to introduce a bill on privilege. Given the fact that the President and the uh, Speaker in the House of Representatives had never done so in the Federation, indeed, neither in the House of Commons or the House of Lords. Harry's response was so immediate and so strongly affirmative that it led me to suspect that Harry had already discussed this very possibility with the clerk and that threw him with the Senate President. So as much as we would like to take credit for this unprecedented move, the sequence of events was that the clerk, then, then clerk, Alan Cumming Tong, and Harry, then deputy clerk, had suggested this course of action to the president, and I had simply stumbled upon the idea serotypously. This has now been confirmed by the then president, the Honourable Doug McClellan, who in private correspondence to the clerk wrote, I well recollect Alan Cumming Tong, the then clerk of the Senate, and Harry Evans, coming into my office in the old Parliament House and expressing their concern about the recently delivered judgment of Mr Justice Hunt in the Lionel Murphy matter, which basically destroyed the principle of parliamentary privilege. It was as a result of that discussion that we agreed that something had to be done by the Parliament itself to reassert this vital principle. And we determined that the only way was the introduction of a completely new bill into the Australian Parliament guaranteeing to its members the long-held privilege of the Westminster system. Alan had Harry work on the drafting of the legislation and I had a discussion with Senator John Button, the then leader of the government in the Senate, and basically it all flowed from that original discussion I had with the two Senate officers. This episode illustrates well, I think, how pivotal was the role undertaken by Harry Evans but also how delicately he had to step to ensure absolute integrity in his relations with the various people he was required to assist. In due course, the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives introduced a bill to patriot privileges and such an action by the presiding officers had never been taken, as I said before, in the history of the Federal Parliament. Of course, these highly formal mechanisms for assisting the Senate and the Senators 
did not consume all of Harry's working day. Harry's concern for enabling senators to go about their business in an effective manner saw him spend considerable time and effort devising innovative approaches to the Senate's daily workload. However, his ethical approach meant that he didn't offer these without being asked. Nevertheless, once asked, one could almost be assured that Harry would be ready. I well remember approaching Harry about our frustration as a small group of senators holding the balance of power. We were constantly being presented with bills coming into the Senate at very short notice and being expected to debate them without consultation or research. The rush of bills turned into an avalanche as the end of each sitting session approached. I don't think it's unusual uh, in wanting to know what the bill before us actually did and what might be its benefits and disadvantages. However, without any members, as we weren't, in the House of Representatives, our party had not taken up a position on those bills which had been in introduced into the House and then forwarded to the Senate. In addition, our staff numbers were minimal compared to those of the major groupings, even though we held a balance of power. It is for these reasons that we had more of a concern than others in the Senate at the time. I hasten to add that they do not put the blame entirely in the government's lap. I remember a senior cabinet minister telling me of his frustration and how he had begged, pleaded and demanded but still had been unable to get his hands on a draft of one of his bills until the end of the session, when they didn't stop arriving in his desk. Harry had clearly been considering the issue for some time, for he was able to produce a file from his desk drawer and show me a series of possible motions aimed at establishing a cut-off by imposing a deadline of bills coming from the House of Representatives. This was a novel and innovative approach and certainly caught the attention of members of my party room when I put the proposal to them. The then opposition was only too happy to support the motions provided to me by Harry, since they too were feeling the pressure, particularly around those bills which hadn't been introduced into the House of Representatives previously. These procedures operated for a number of years and as the President said, were generally known as the Macklin motions. Naturally, as government sought new ways of overcoming the Senate imposed deadline, the approach to obtaining reasonable debating time has had to be refined, a number of times indeed, but the general idea has become a permanent part of the Senate's approach to its work. One is able to see from what I have said that running behind Harry's approach was a strong political ideal. It was based on what Harry termed his Whig propensities, referring to those in Britain who in previous centuries had worked to limit the power of the monarch by seeking to make the parliament supreme. However, if it were to be supreme, then in Harry's mind, it clearly had to be accountable. Accountability in Australian political environment has had a chequered history one has to only avert to the stance taken by a number of major media outlets after the last election that relied upon the belief that if a party had achieved a majority in the House of Representatives, then they should be completely free to do whatever they liked without let or hindrance, and particularly no interference from the Senate. Unfortunately, party discipline in Australia is so strong that government backbenchers no longer seem to believe it is their duty to hold their own government to account by scrutinising its actions, but rather take the role to be that rather strange nodding backdrop to whatever government minister happens to be saying on a television program. One only has to think back to a giant like the Liberal Senator David Hamer to realise that this was not always the case. It is for this reason that accountability within the federal parliamentary structure has been left to the Senate where it has, as it does most times, a non-government majority. In a chapter from an edited book where Harry was considering the outcome of the 2004 election, which gave the coalition parties a one-seat majority from the 1st of July 2005, 
He averted to the fact that there had been a 24-year hiatus since this last had occurred, when the Fraser government had a majority of six, from 1976 to 1981. However, as Harry pointed out during that previous parliament, the government never really controlled the Senate because there were up to 12 coalition backbenchers who were willing to vote against the government, particularly on accountability issues. And there was therefore little fear of a major decline in accountability. In his opening address to the Association of Parliamentary Librarians of Australasia Conference on the 26th of July 2007, Harry said this, Parliamentary libraries have continued to provide members of parliament with facts and analysis. By doing so, they necessarily live dangerously. The holders of power do not necessarily welcome facts and analysis that do not support their cause. They spend a great deal of time and energy suppressing and manipulating facts and analysis which appear to threaten their hold on power. Anyone who produces facts and analysis contrary to that consideration is likely to be unpopular with the powers that be. Here one can plainly hear Harry talking not only about the parliamentary library but also about his own situation. As an outstanding and outspoken advocate of the rights of the Senate, he certainly managed to upset the governments of all political persuasions, which one would expect from someone who wrote, one of the principal functions of a legislative assembly is to ensure that the holders of the executive power are accountable. That is, that they are required to explain to the legislature and the public what they are doing with the power entrusted to them. This requirement is an essential safeguard against mistake and malfeasance in government. Given such views expressed by Harry, both privately and publicly, it's probably not a coincidence that Harry was the last clerk to serve 21 years, given that the Howard government introduced a 10-year term non-renewable limit in 1999. Harry, however, was in good company, as he himself pointed out when quoting Professor, later President Wilson. Unless the legislator have and use every means of acquainting itself with the acts and the disposition of the administration agents of the government, the country must be helpless to learn how it is being served. And unless the legislature both scrutinises these things and sifts them through by forms of discussion, the country must remain in embarrassing and crippling ignorance. An excellent example of this occurred in 1999, when the then Howard government refused to release documents on the purchases of magnetic resonance imaging machines. Harry provided advice that the government's reasons for refusing were novel and lacking in cogency. This damning advice, together with the subsequent Senate Estimates Committee hearing, led to the release of these documents, which in turn led to an Auditor General's report concerning serious administrative deficiencies. The paper from 2007, from which I've already quoted, probably puts Harry's views most succinctly, since the title of the paper was, Having the Numbers Means Not Having to Explain the effects of the government majority in the Senate. This approach to accountability by Harry flowed through to a wide range of other issues connected to the contributions of what he saw as the Senate's unique role. While Harry's arguments often relied upon historical precedent, it would be wrong to think of him as a traditionalist in the normal sense that we take that word. He was not. While he did speak up for the maintenance of tradition, he only did so when the tradition contributed to the furtherance of what he saw as the Senate's role to maintain accountability. In 2004, Harry made this very clear when he gave an address at the 35th Conference of Australasian and Pacific Presiding Officers and Clerks, making the telling point that all reform must be considered and gradual, but reform is nevertheless necessary if people are continue to have faith in the system. In his submission 
on the opening ceremony by the Department of the uh, Senate to the House of Representatives Procedures Committee, he made these points. The appointment of justices of the High Court as deputies of the Governor General is contrary to the separation of legislative, executive and judicial functions entrenched in the Constitution and a violation of the principle that judicial officers exercise only judicial functions. That still occurs. The Governor-General's opening speech, which sets out the government's program, involves the Governor-General, who is otherwise supposed to be politically neutral head of state, in speaking as if he or she were the actual head of state and in making contentious and partisan political statements. It still happens. The Governor-General purports to direct the two houses as to where they are to meet, which is not authorised by the Constitution. And that still happens. The Governor-General attends in the Senate chamber and summons the House of Representatives to attend there, as if the Governor-General had some peculiar relationship with the Senate, as distinct from the House of Representatives, analogous to the relationship between the monarch and the House of Lords. There is no such relationship under the Australian Constitution which provides for two elected houses as co-equal participants in the legislative process. That still happens. One can see Harry's points, particularly in the second and third one of those, I think, about the British precedents. Unfortunately, the committee didn't take up that submission and so such strange throwbacks continue. In the 1980s, I remember being told by a colleague that when speaking about a point of order that arose during the vision, I would hold a piece of paper over my head. It seems that this came from the House of Lords, where one remained seated wearing one's hat during making such a point of order. The idea that the presiding officer could see a senator sitting as the others entered the chamber while the bells was ringing, whether they were wearing a hat or not is obviously plainly silly. Uh, Harry had pointed out this piece of nonsense, and indeed it had been dealt with by one of his predecessors, J. E. Edwards, in 1938, but still it went on. This quaint practice, however, illustrates well what Harry was about when he sought reform. His concern was that such excuses, such exercises, can bring the serious legislative operations of the chamber into disrepute. One has only to listen to Harry hold forth on what he called the unhealthy obsession with the mace to know that he had a point. He was particularly concerned when anyone said that the mace was a symbol of the supremacy of the parliament, since he saw such a statement as not only silly, but a dangerous misrepresentation of the constitutional position of our parliament. Harry tellingly went on, when we get to the level of maces having to be coloured, covered in the actual presence of royalty, we have entered the realm of magic, which even the most determined obscurantist find it hard to defend. Then the radical arrives to denounce it all as mumbo jumbo, and we are in danger of losing procedures which may be traditional and quaint, but which can be useful. And I think there was a telling point. As I've indicated, Harry's objection to many practices was based on a need for constitutional propriety. Hence, we are often in discussion with Harry, uh, got taken to another one of his areas of interest, the Federation debates and the ideas underpinning the final form of the Australian Constitution. Indeed, I understand he was behind having the constitutional debates put on line on the Senate website. Those particular underpinning ideas to our constitution were crystallised for him in a notion of the continuing talk about the Westminster system. I quote from his powerful paper in Reform of 2001. A related misconception is that Australia was intended to have a system of government basically similar to that of the United Kingdom. This misconception is embodied in the frequently heard statement that we have a Westminster system. On the contrary, the frame of our constitution explicitly and deliberately departed from the British model. Of course, 
Once we note that this idea of the Westminster system, referred to by many even in 2015, is highly supportive of the notion of the all-powerful cabinet, then we can see where Harry is coming from. The government in power, and in particular prime ministers, have a real interest in talking up this idea and acting as though this was the actual state of our federation. The idea has also leached into the mainstream media where we found journalists railing against the Senate as though they were talking about the Westminster system. Unfortunately, as Harry often reminded us, the House of Representatives is not the House of Commons and the Senate is not the House of Lords. Harry discussed this idea in more depth in a paper entitled Hobbes versus Madison and Isaac versus Baker, Contrary Theories and Practices in Australian Democracy. As Harry pointed out, the political theories of Hobbes, which sought to centre all power in a cabinet according to the British model, had contended in the constitutional debates with those of Madison, who looked to the dispersal of power with a variety of checks and balances along the American model. And this debate eventually became distilled in a proposition that no law should pass into force in Australia unless it was supported by a majority of voting Australians and a majority of voting Australians in a majority of states. This became to be seen as the essence of federation. When it came to operationalising this idea in concrete proposals in the Constitution, there are often uneasy compromises, particularly with the installation of a powerful government on the one hand and near equal powers of the two houses of the parliament on the other. A good example of this involves the absolute control of finances that the House of Commons had gained over time. Thus we see in section 53 of the constitution, the compromise in stark relief. The Senate can't amend some money bills but is able to request amendments to these bills. Of course, there is a merging in practice between the passing of an amendment and the passing of an request for an amendment, since the Senate is able, on such amendments, to keep insisting until such times as the House agrees. As a consequence, Harry believed that the constitutional battles leading up to 1901 are still being fought because of the subsequent rise of the rigid party system. The Madisonians' concern with the Hobbesarians' powerful prime ministers on almost total cabinet control over the House still resonates in almost every attack on the Senate and in every debate about how to alter the Senate voting system. Having been in the Senate under governments of different political persuasions, I must say that I entirely agree with Harry's view when he wrote, the arrival of organised political parties and the presence of the same parties in the Senate as in the House of Representatives did not end the ideological divide, but perpetuated it in a different form. Parties simply change sides according to whether they are in government or in opposition. The party in power tends to support the prerogatives of the executive government and the exclusive rights of the House of Representatives, while the party in opposition tends to support parliamentary checks and balances and adjust their theoretical positions accordingly. I noted time and again that the most ardent supporters of Senate rights had in the previous parliament, while I was sitting in the chamber, been amongst its most vehement critics and they didn't even blush as they did so. As Harry again noted, it was the arrival of proportional representation in 1949 that saw the Senate emerge as more representative than the House of Representatives, since the political party's seats in the Senate are generally closer in their share in the overall vote than the numbers in the House. Interestingly enough, there is almost nil attention paid to the unrepresentative outcomes produced by the House of Representatives electoral system, since it happens to be in the interest of the major parties to ignore such issues. In 2015, we have moved 
on somewhat from those constitutional baits, at least in terms of the formulation of the issues. Thus the fight between the Hobbesarian and the Madisonian theories is often more played out over the notion of mandate. As Harry Sagely puts it, we haven't heard the last of the mandate. It's sure to re-emerge whenever there is an election which a government can claim to have won and whoever is then in opposition will no doubt be impressed with the requirements for checks and balances. That was 14 years ago. What I have sketched out of Harry's activities today merely scratches the surface of his contributions to the Senate and parliamentary democracy in Australia. His intellectual and organisational skills provided the Senate with an operational system that has served it well in the difficult times it's had to reverse in this very building. He was never one to wilt under attack, but rather in than engage in polemic or personal responses, he invariably remained focused on the argument of the case, and invariably the strength of his argument was recognised. His was a highly focused contribution to the furtherance of the work of the Senate. In everything Harry did, he worked to ensure that rationality won out over baseless assertions, integrity won out over expediency, and the future needs of a federation won out over partisan gains of the present. It was certainly a privilege to have known Harry Evans and to have worked with him to implement many of his ideas and that he held so dear. Here was a great man of whom we rarely see the like. Thank you, Michael. That is a, a masterful introduction to the series of Harry Evans lectures, and I think you've set a, a very high standard for the future. I mean, listening to you has brought back so many uh, memories about Harry's work in the 20, 20 years I was privileged to work with him. But I think you also bring out uh, the idea that you know, working in Parliament, being an elected member of Parliament, being a parliamentary officer, there's a sense of partnership between the two. I mean, it's all very well for parliamentary officers to um, be learned in, in the ways of parliaments, but we are not actors. And uh, we rely on actors such as yourself and many people in this room who have, have undertaken the role of elected member to um, prosecute those ideas, to be inspired by parliamentary officers sometimes, to be advised by them. But it really is a partnership, and I think you've um, brought that out very well tonight. We, we do have a few minutes for um, questions or, or comments, and if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, I'd invite you to come to one of the microphones in the middle of the room, and I'm sure Michael will deal with those uh, admirably. Don't be shy. Even if you would like to share a, a reminiscence, <laughs> that would be that would be fine. Stunned silence. Well, I I can't believe this audience <laughs> is going to remain silent, and it, it it only takes one person to start. And there better be a volunteer, or I'll finger someone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. I wonder what Harry Evans would have thought about some of the remaining anachronisms in parliamentary procedures, including the sort of religious kowtowing to one particular religion in a multicultural society? I actually know the answer to that. Yes. Well, well, you answer it because I was going to say, I never put that to Harry, in which case I don't know what he stood for on it because as I said in my address, uh, he was a person who had to walk a very fine line. He would respond and respond enthusiastically, providing I put the question. <laughs> and then he had the answer. It was generally here. Um, 
uh, much to the chagrin often of the government in the House of Representatives, particularly when we did things like the, um, the flow of business between the chambers. All of that was all on paper, all in his desk, but I had to ask the question. Um, so I leave it to you if you know well, the answer. Well, I'm not sure if I, I should share it, but uh, <laughs> I do remember a new officer to the Department of the Senate, who might be in this room at the moment, who had taken courage in his hands and, and asked Harry how he felt about you know, going through prayers every morning when the Senate kicked off. And he said something about, oh, well, I just close my eyes and, and, and mutter pagan intonations. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I, I don't think says anything about his belief system, but it was a perfect answer. <laughs> Whatever he thought, you weren't going to you find out. You weren't going out. to find out, though. <laughs> I can comment on that, too. Please. <laughs> yes, thanks. When I took on the position of, um, of president of the Senate, I, I was challenged by that because I'm an atheist and I, I didn't want to read out a prayer one, of one particular religion when there were several represented. And I took the matter up with Harry, but I canvassed support around the senators also. Harry was actually very supportive and, and encouraged me to do it, <laughs> but I couldn't get the support. <laughs> <laughs> And the support hasn't been there since that no. time, Mr President, either. I can certainly give you a real insight into the importance of prayers. When I was in the Senate, I was advised by one of the Liberal senators, being a Labour senator, that I should go to prayers every day because we had to actually appear in the chamber if we were going to get paid. And a good way of doing it was to turn up to prayers in case you forgot. <laughs> but um, I'd like to raise a more serious point, and that is that I think all of us have seen in the media and from various sources that the country has become ungovernable because of the Senate, because the government doesn't control the Senate. Now, you're a better historian than I am, but... Um, Certainly, I can't remember a time when a Labor government controlled the Senate. Mm. And uh, I can't remember very times, many, many times, as you alluded um, to, periods when any other party mm. controlled the Senate. And yet here we are. It seems that we've existed mm. quite well with that circumstance. Mm. Um, don't you think it's going a little far? Um, my wife is in the audience, so I'll be very careful because yeah, I get on my high horse about the media <laughs> and its reflection on the parliament because I think much of it is in, done in ignorance. But um, the, the operation during the time I was there, uh, and that's really what uh, I know about because I actually haven't kept the figures since, is that we in fact put th through more bills through the chamber than any previous parliament had done. And I think, in fact, each parliament has probably done fairly similar. They may take longer. Some of them may be knocked back. There may be more amendments. But I do remember a Liberal senator once telling me, um, quite recently, in fact, that when I was talking to him about this paper and I was talking to him about um, the comments that Harry had made with regard to um, them losing the, the government getting control of the Senate. And he said, it's the worst thing that ever happened to us. He said, we lost, of course, the following election because we didn't have the checks and balances. And I think that's a rather interesting idea that perhaps the slowing down bit <laughs> might be bad instead of the rush of blood to the head. Uh, I come from Queensland where a unicameral parliament operates and I think our previous government went out of office from a huge majority for exactly the same reason. Absolutely nil checks and balances. It didn't have to listen to anybody and it didn't. And the people spoke. A further question, comment or sharing of a reminiscence? Martin, Could, would you like to come to the microphone?
just a curiosity as to whether either of you uh, know where he stood on the casual vacancies change made in the mid 70s. Do you? Yes, but I'm not. Well, you can talk. Yes, no, I, no, I, 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 I had long discussions on this one, but I, I will defer to the clerk on this. Well, well I don't know that, that I know the answer to this. I do remember fierce discussions between Harry and Anne Lynch, his yes. deputy, about whether it was a good thing or not. And I don't really remember which side Harry took. Um, I, I do remember Anne um, thinking that it was not necessarily a good thing to allow political parties to be entrenched in the constitution mm. for the first time mm. and, and for, for them to um, have the right, if you like, to uh, nominate a replacement for a retiring senator. But of course, the, the counter argument was that, that nobody wanted to revisit the events of, of 1975 and, and the, the actions by state premiers in, in that year in filling casual vacancies or appointing people to, to casual mm. vacancies, not from the same party as, um, as the departing mm. or the deceased senators, but from, um, f from a position that was designed to manipulate the current numbers mm, in the Senate. Mm. So, um, yeah, very, very difficult. I don't know if yeah, we know the yeah. answer to that one. Yeah. Would you like to add? Uh, to that? Well, basically, Harry was moving much more towards the second position rather than the first, on the basis that, as he saw it, the democratic um, voice was more likely to be heard in the second than in the first situation. Um, again, of course, a lot of that problem was caused by the then government of my state, in which <laughs> that managed to actually try to appoint someone who, uh, uh, well, yeah, I think he did, did he become a senator? Did he get in the, I don't know, know whether he actually managed to get a seat, Field. Albert Field, yes, mm, yes, he did. All oh, right, yes. yeah, I can't remember, it wasn't for very long. Marion. Thank you, Rosemary. I just thought it might be appropriate for me to use this occasion to acknowledge Harry's great contribution to the Democratic Audit of Australia. I mean, on, yes. on the topic, of course, of executive counta accountability yeah. to the legislature, he was, um, you know, could always be relied on to, to yeah. attend a workshop or read a paper and so on. Yes. And uh, afterwards, of course, he also did a wonderful chapter for this book, Silencing Dissent. Yep. On, on the same subject. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Thank you for that, Marion. Yeah. Um, and I think one thing you have highlighted in your lecture, Michael, is the, the breadth and depth of Harry's writing, yeah. Yeah. Um, which um, um, is very accessible, much of it accessible through the Senate yes. website, through yes. Papers on Parliament, including a special edition in number 52, which does uh, contain that uh, immortal paper on parliamentary <laughs> reform, which has in the title the, the traditional, the quaint and the useful <laughs> pitfalls of parliamentary reform. Oh. And it's an absolute gem to it read. Is. Is. And, and I commend <laughs> it to all of you. But I think that all of you are, are here tonight because of uh, a respect for Harry and admiration for his work as a, a great parliamentary officer. And Michael, in, in your lecture, I think you've brought out many of the, the issues which concerned him, which he was able to contribute to public debate and put through uh, senators, through the agents of senators such as yourself and others who came after you. Um, you did an awful lot to bring the Senate into the modern age, to make it a relevant and uh, useful chamber, an absolute essential check on governments of, of all persuasions and uh, one that that remains um, a fantastic place mm. to, uh, to to operate and to work so on behalf of everybody here tonight I thank you for that inaugural okay. Harry Evans lecture I, I think it was a, a wonderful uh, account of a re the relationship between you and Harry and what you were ab ab um, able to achieve together but also, I think, a portrait of, of a, a terrific parliamentary officer and one who lives in our hearts. Thank you very much. You. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Tom Bridge.